And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. Uh, feet like a calf's hoof for cherubim. Seraphim had feet and living beings, we suppose, but it's not mentioned. Uh, the cherubim had four wings, as two of them touched one another, and with two of them they flew. The seraphim had six wings, two to cover their face, two to cover their feet, and two to fly. And the living beings have six wings. Cherubim have human form. The cherubim have four faces on each cherub. Man, lion, bull, and eagle. Seraphim were not told about his face. And living beings, as we discussed last week, there is one like a lion. Separate being has one like a calf. Third being has one like a man. And the fourth being has a face like an eagle. Concerning their legs, the cherubim have straight legs. They don't have knees. Concerning motion, the cherubim did not turn as they went. Whatever face was facing in the direction that they were going furnished the information. So they would just go and their face would see wherever they were going. They didn't have to turn in order to go. And they flew. I'm sorry, the seraphim flew. The cherubim went to and fro like lightning. And wheels, mentioned concerning the cherubim, spirit, their spirit was in the wheel, so the, the mind, the thinking, the emotions of a cherub was in the wheel which was with him. Cherub and wheel, same spirit. Eyes are not mentioned for cherubim or seraphim, but in living beings, they were full of eyes in front and behind, and then a separate verse says around and within. And only concerning the living beings is a chant mentioned, holy, holy, holy. They referred to God as almighty and worshiped him as eternal. And the references you have there. I think I'll just sit down this evening because a lot of people asked me this morning why I didn't. <laughs> I was feeling pretty good this morning. Still feeling pretty good this evening. Praise the Lord. We are in Revelation chapter 5. And uh, there was a search going on for someone worthy to open a book. Verse 1, Revelation 5, verse... Am I ready to go here? All right. Revelation 5, verse 1. I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a book written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. I saw is used to indicate a fresh object within a setting already introduced. And so you will see the same use in verses 1, 2, 6, and 11 in this passage. I saw this, saw this, saw this. It's all within the scene which was introduced in chapter 4. After these things I saw introduced the scene in Revelation 4, 1. Am I making sense? The scene, here's a fresh scene, Revelation 4, 1. After these things I saw. Then when he says, I saw, just that by itself, I saw, I saw, it's all in that same scene. They're in the same location. In the right hand. I don't know why it mentions the right hand. It mentions it again later on. It was in the right hand. Uh, but the way that it's spoken tells us that it was on the open palm. It was lying on the hand. He was not gripping it. 
was held out like, now the hand could have been cup shaped, didn't have to be, you know, absolutely flat, but it's telling us that the, the book was lying on the hand. Chapter 4 gave no hint as to the form of the person on the throne. Remember, it was like alabaster and like sardis, sardius or sardis stone. Uh, and we, we talked about what that signified, but it didn't tell us anything about the appearance of the person. Now we have a, another detail. He has a hand. He has a hand that's holding this book. The book. The book is a scroll. Now, the word book, the, the Greek is biblios, and of course, you know, we get our word Bible from that. And uh, it normally refers to a scroll. Can refer to a book, like we think of a book. You've got a book and you can open it and turn pages. Book form versus scroll form, where it's all rolled up. And the this is a scroll form. The book format was developed just about the time that John was writing. John was off on the Isle of Patmos, so God probably didn't give him the word biblios to refer to a book. His mind would not have referred to a book. It was uh, too new a technology. It's one of the rules of interpretation. You interpret according to the understanding the person or who was writing or the people to whom it was written would have at the time. We have another indication that it was a scroll, and that is that it says it was written inside and on the back. Uh, of course, uh, we have books all the time. They're written inside and on the back, and you might think of that that way. But what this meant was, it was written inside behind the seals, so you had to work, open the first seal to begin reading. And as you would open each successive seal, you'd be able to read more. On the back means that after you had released the seal, some of it would be out, and you could turn the document over, and it was very efficient use of the parchment or whatever. It was written on that side also. And that suggests to us the scroll format once again. The content of this book is a revelation of the future. This is really the revelation which is the subject of the whole book that we call Revelation. This scroll has the whole thing. It comes from the hand of God the Father. And as it is opened up, it's not read. As each seal on the scroll is opened, there's a drama. First seal is opened, and there's a man on a white horse. And he's, he's uh, introduced there, and we'll talk about that when we get to that point. He opens up uh, another seal and another horse, and another seal and another horse. But it's, it's the drama, it's being acted out, the things that are, ha are happening as each of the seals are opened. So the seals are judgments. It's God's judgment on the world. And it happens in seven stages, seven seals. And that's the subject of the rest of the book. Chapters 2 and 3 told us God's judgment on the city. churches. God's judgment on the churches. 4 in chapter 2, 3 in chapter 3. Judgment must begin at the house of God. So judgment begins in Revelation at the house of God, chapters 2 and 3. Chapter 4, we have the throne room, and in the throne room, the prominent thing is a, a scroll. And that scroll has seals, and as each seal is opened, it's judgment on the earth. So judgment starts on the churches in chapters 2 and 3, continues on the rest of the land in chapters 6 through 19. 
when the seventh seal is broken, it activates seven trumpet judgments. The content of the seventh seal is seven trumpet judgments. So you have to count all the trumpet judgments as part of the judgment coming forth from this scroll that is here being introduced. When the seventh trumpet sounds, there are seven bowls full of wrath that are poured out. So the seven bowls full of wrath are included amongst the trumpet judgments, specifically the seventh trumpet judgment. And since the trumpet judgments are under the seals, the bowl judgments are also under the seals. So this book that is introduced here has as its content, content the judgments of God on all the earth. All the judgments. And when we get to the end of the seals, uh, the earth is restored to its rightful owner, Jesus Christ. All sin and all of its effects disappear, and the servants of the Lamb administer the kingdom with the king. So this book is central to the whole thing. John could see seven seals. Now that means the seals were on the edge of the roll because this book is still sealed. Nothing's been opened. So he can see on the edge of the roll, okay, here's one, okay, there's two, and he saw seven seals. And so uh, that tells us a little bit about how the seals were applied. Next in verses 2 and 3, we have the question asked, I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to break its seals? And no one in heaven on, or on earth or under the earth was able to open the book or to look into it. This is the second of 20 times in the book of Revelation that we have a loud voice. And they are not all in as significant a, a setting as this one, but many are. For example, turn the page. In chapter 5 and verse 12, a loud voice proclaims the Lamb worthy to open the scroll. Big event. Can't find anybody worthy to open the scroll. The Lamb is worthy. Loud voice. Chapter 11, verse 15, the loud voice announces the establishment of Christ's kingdom. Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. Loud voice. Chapter 12 and verse 10. A loud voice announces that Satan's cast out of heaven. There's an event for you. In chapter 14 and verse 9, a loud voice announces the doom of everybody who receives the mark of the beast. Chapter 16, verse 17, a loud voice announces after the seventh bowl of judgment, it is done. And so it is. As I say, there are 20 of them. This is only a sampling. What about five of them that I shared with you? And uh, the next question we confront here is who is worthy? Who's going to be able to open the scroll? And the point of the question is that there isn't anybody in heaven or earth or even under the earth who is worthy to open the scroll. We're making a point of this. God is underlining and double underlining no one is worthy to open this scroll. Christ's worthiness is found in his messianic office. He's the son of David, verse 5. 
and he has made a sacrifice to redeem men in verse 9. So Christ is the only one who has either of these qualifications. He's worthy because of these two things, assigned by God to be the Messiah and having made the sacrifice for the sins of men. He's going to be the judge, and he's going to give judgment on all those who have not received the Savior. He is the Savior. He made the sacrifice. He made a sacrifice sufficient for the sins of all mankind. And all these who are judged in the seven seals, every one of them has refused Jesus Christ. None of them have received the Savior, and the Savior is the one who is worthy to make the judgment. And he is worthy to make the judgment because he made the sacrifice. All right. How about those under the earth? Who would be under the earth? Pretty sure can only be the lost and demons. Why would I say that? Because everybody who is a child of God is either on the earth or in heaven. None of them is under the earth. So the folks under the earth by elimination have to be the lost and demons could certainly be included. The intent is to say no one is worthy. And to include the demons as not being worthy is certainly appropriate. There isn't any demonic being who is worthy to open the scrolls. No one was able. It's an imperfect tense. And imperfect has to do with ongoing, situ an ongoing situation. Imperfect meaning it hasn't come to perfection. It hasn't come to completion. It is ongoing. No one is worthy. No one is worthy. No one is worthy. No one is worthy. No one is able to open it. John weeps, verse 4. Then I began to weep greatly, because no one was found worthy to open the book or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. Why is John weeping? It's not just because he's disappointed that he can't find out what's inside the scroll. It's not just that he's disappointed with the moral state of people because they're unworthy to open the scroll. It is a profound disappointment because the culmination of world affairs and the establishment of Jesus Christ on the throne will be delayed until someone can be found worthy to open the scroll. He's eager for the glory of God. He is eager for the honor of Jesus Christ. He's told to stop weeping because it is not necessary. Jesus would qualify to open the book. Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Genesis 49.9 is where this idea starts out. Judah is a lion's whelp. From my, the prey, my son, you have gone up. He couches. He lies down as a lion. And as a lion, who dares rouse him up? So here we are with the, the blessing of Joseph on the, is it the blessing of Joseph in 49, or was it the blood? Somebody was given a blessing, and they're identifying the, the 12 tribes. Seems to me like it ought to be Jacob. Yeah. And God gives him this information about Judah. Judah Judah's the lion. 
And then that figures into the book of Revelation many, many, many years later when it, he is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Jesus is the noblest son this tribe has ever produced. He'd be the noblest son of any group. And in his unstoppable power and fierce presentation, he's like a lion. You don't want to go out and confront a lion without a very powerful weapon. But Jesus can confront anyone. He's like a lion. He's also the root of David, Isaiah 11, 1 and 2. Then a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. Now Jesse is who? Father of David. So it doesn't mention David here, but uh, it does speak of the, the fact that's related in David as the, the root of I'm sorry, Jesus is the root of David. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. This is Isaiah 11, 2. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and strength, the spirit of knowledge, and the fear of the Lord. Then in verse 5, you see that it says, he has overcome. He has overcome. He's the victory. He's the victor in doing the victory. Where was the victory achieved? Jesus Christ is the victor. Where did he achieve the victory? At the cross. Exactly. He overcame at the cross. And his victory means that the scroll will be opened and its judgments will be made. Now we think of the cross in terms of salvation. We take the, think of the cross in terms of people going to heaven. But here is the cross, the victory at the cross, which is the authority for the opening of the scroll for the judgment of all of the lost. Seven seals are activated by the overcomer. Now in verse 6, the lamb comes into view. We've been told that he is worthy, but here it is. And I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Twenty-four elders are farther out from the throne than the four livings. But the way it states it is here, I saw between the throne and the elders a lamb standing. And in parenthesis you have with four living creatures. We saw before the four living creatures are around the throne. They're in close proximity. But this verse says, I saw between the throne and the 24 elders. So we're not told whether he's inside the circle of livings or outside the circle of livings. He's inside the circle of the 24 elders and he's outside the throne. It's between the throne and the 24 elders. He appears as if slain. It's a lamb as if slain, but he is doing what? He is standing. Obviously, he is not slain at this point, but he looks like a lamb slain. What would he look like? He would have... Well, perhaps, or maybe it would just be the scars of the encounter from long before. As if slain. He looked damaged enough to have been slain. And of course, it's referring again to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. He has seven horns. And the seven horns don't relate to somebody weak after almost dying. Seven horns relate to power. Horns signify power. Psalm 18, 2, the Lord is my rock 
and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield, and the horn of my salvation. Horn, power. Psalm 75, verse 10. And all the horns of the wicked he will cut off, but the horns of the righteous will be lifted up. The wicked are going to lose all of their power. The righteous will have their power increased. Ezekiel 34, 21. Because you push with side and with shoulder and thrust at all the weak with your horns until you have scattered them abroad. The horns have the power here to scatter. Daniel 7, 8. While I was contemplating the horns, behold, another horn, a little one, came up among them. And three of the first horns were per pulled out by the roots before it. And behold, this horn possessed eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth uttering great boasts. So the horn represents power. This lamb, as if slain, has seven horns. We're not going to pursue it, but it's pretty commonly agreed that seven is the number of completeness. Seven horns is a representation of complete power. Jesus Christ is God the Son, and as God the Son, he has the characteristic of being omnipotent. Seven horns represent his power. This lamb also has seven eyes. Eyes indicate observation and intelligence. The seven horns and the seven eyes together are the seven spirits of God. Now, we, we talked about that pretty carefully back in chapter 1. We concluded that the seven spirits of God was a way to represent the Holy Spirit in his fullness, seven being the number of fullness. And these seven spirits of God, he's representation of the Holy Spirit, are sent out into all the earth. So seven spirits are sent out all over the world. And they look at everything. And they come back. And they, they have Jesus Christ prepared to make judgment. Because what have they seen when they've looked all over the world? They have seen evil in all of its forms all over the world. And so the Holy Spirit is the perfect observer, the perfect judge to make these judgments. And he is uh, equipping Jesus Christ to uh, make the judgment. I think I'll get up and wander around a little bit so that uh, the cameraman won't totally go to sleep back there. There's no challenge whatsoever to this process when I shouldn't get up off of my chair. Uh-huh. Is that somewhere near where it's supposed to be, Aldea? Mike over here. Okay, here we go. Verse 7, Revelation 5, 7. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. When he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each one holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense. I've got to find some place to put this thing. It's dangling. That's why it pulled the thing off. Each one holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Okay. He came and took. He was alongside the Father, perhaps. If he was alongside the Father, he shifted position so as to take the scroll. Or perhaps he was out in front. He was somewhere inside the circle of elders, in which case he moved closer to take the book. How does a lamb take a book? With his hands, <laughs> most lambs are lacking in that department. Yeah. 
But, but Jesus makes a transition from this image of a lamb back into the uh, human-like image of Jesus Christ. How do we know this? Well, he needs hands to break the seals. He's going to break the seals. A lamb is not well equipped for doing that task. He'll be the rider on the white horse. A lamb is not well equipped to ride a horse. So we're acknowledging, we're seeing here that he made a transition at some point. And I think the logical point is just before he took the scroll, because he's going to need to be able to use those hands to take the scroll. So he took is in perfect tense. And that says he took it to possess it forever. He took the scroll, and it is his ongoing. His action impacts all of history and all of the earth. This is the thing. He takes the scroll, and that means the judgment is sealed. All of the earth is going to be destroyed. It's a major change. We read about the same change in Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. And with these two verses, we close this evening. Daniel 7, 13 and 14. I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. And he came up to the Ancient of Days, and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom, that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. Daniel was given that vision a long time ago. And as John is given the vision, he is seeing somewhat the same thing later on. Because when he takes the book, it's the transfer which in seven short years is going to result in the whole earth being transferred to the Lord and all wickedness wiped away. Yeah, praise the Lord indeed. Shall we pray? Our Father and our God, thank you. Thank you that Jesus Christ was found worthy to take the scroll. Thank you for telling us of these future things. Thank you for encouraging us with uh, the knowledge of your power and your control. If we just looked around the world today, we'd think that things were really spinning out of control. But we're very grateful to know that Jesus Christ is still in control. And uh, you're working for the good of your people and for your own glory. Be with us this week. Thank you for the answer to our prayers for Dave Carzino and Linda Mozak and Marilyn's son and so many others. In Jesus' name, amen.